Keep the Bible open there in front of you. And I want to ask this morning as we start out our time together, uh, how big is your view of God? How big is your view of God? How, how weighty is God uh, to you? I mean, we've just sung, haven't we? Uh, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. And so I guess I want to ask us this morning, is that what you actually think? Or is it just a nice song to sing with our kids? And if he is big and if he is strong and if he is mighty, then how does that or should that begin to impact the week ahead? As we live with the knowledge of God's glory and weightiness. Because I think my fear for us as a church, and I'm not simply talking about Christchurch Stockport, but more widely the, the church in the UK, which of course includes us, is that we've minimised God. Uh, they're just like our work, that work window that sits quietly open in the background of our computer desktop but is rarely uh, glimpsed at. And just like we saw the Israelites try to do last week as they went into battle with the Philistines, we, we kind of, well, we roll God out when we need him to do our bidding and then we, we, we click that minimise button when the crisis moment uh, is over or time has moved on and we go back to living life on our own terms with often little thought to the God of the universe. So often we can be guilty of thinking, well, God is here to do our bidding. And that actually we're even just doing him a favour by turning up to church this morning. Uh, one writer puts it like this. Uh, left to ourselves, we tend immediately to reduce God to manageable terms. We want to get him where we can use him. Or at least know where he is when we need him. We want a God we can in some measure, some measure control. And yet, as we come to our passage today, God is going to teach Israel, Philistia and us as we listen in a mighty, mighty lesson about his glory, his weightiness, his mighty power and holiness. That ought to cause us to rightly sit up and take stock of how we relate to him, both as a church and uh, as individuals. Uh, so let me pray uh, and then we're going to dive in. Uh, Lord God, Samuel in chapter 3 asks you to speak for your servant hears. And so we pray that this morning we too would be attentive to your word. That you were to speak to us and help us to hear. May we not be hard of heart, but responsive to your words, we pray. Amen. Well, the first thing I want us uh, to see this morning is that it's quite simple, really. Our God is so big. He is so strong and he is so mighty. Uh, so you remember, uh, just to give you some context, if you're here last week, we left off at, at a pretty uh, low point in Israel's history. Uh, in their own arrogance, their own overconfidence, thinking that they could just use God as some sort of lucky charm. Uh, they found themselves defeated in war by the Philistines. And what's worse, the Ark of God, a gold-covered chest that was symbolic of God's presence with his people, has been carried off to uh, Philistine-held Ashdod as a spoil of war. And so as verse 22 of chapter 4, just before our reading puts it, uh, the glory has departed from Israel, for the Ark of God has been captured. We'll now look at verse 2 of chapter 5 at the beginning of our reading. Then the Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it up beside Dagon. Yahweh, that's the, the God of Israel, the God of whom Israelite children no doubt sang. Our God is so big and so strong and might, so mighty has been reduced, it seems, to a bit part God. In the house of one of the many gods of the Philistines. Uh, just like defeat for Israel meant that they would serve the Philistines, well now it seems that defeat for Yahweh, the God of Israel, he must now serve under Dagon. This is a low moment for the people of Israel. God's glory has left the nation. And with it go all the promises of God, don't they? You remember the Bible promises, the promises of land and of people and of blessing, of a return to that Edenic heavenly paradise that their forefathers once knew and had thrown away. They must seem so far off. I mean, it seems that, the God, that God isn't the Almighty after all. 
It seems that he's made all these promises, but he just can't deliver. It seems that our God isn't the biggest, the strongest, or most mighty, because now he shares a bit part in the temple of another. The glory of God hasn't simply left Israel, it seems it's left God. Perhaps he's not the God that he's claimed to be all along. But of course, appearances can be deceptive, can't they? Because through these apparently devastating events for Israel, God is going to go to work. And he's going to reveal just how big and just how strong and just how mighty he is. And it starts there in verse 3. Uh, the ark, as we know, has been, has been placed in the apparently mighty, victorious Dagon's temple. But the next morning, as the people turn up to worship, well, Dagon's statue is lying face down, prostrate before the ark of God. And you notice the comedy moment that the, that the uh, writer writes in here. There's this comedy, do you, do you see it, verse 3? So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. The mighty God Dagon, uh, lying on the ground before the ark of uh, God, is helpless. He needs the hands of people to stand him upright, to put him back in his place. What kind of God needs people? But nevertheless, he's back on his plinth. Well, for a few hours at least. Because verse 4, when the Philistines arrive to worship the next morning, once again, Dagon is down. But this time, do you see his head and his hands have been cut off? And this is significant because this is what happened to the rulers and losers in war. In a few weeks' time, we'll be looking at the events around uh, David and Goliath. And this is exactly what happens to Goliath as he lies defeated, prostrate before David, who does what? Removes his head. Oh, Yahweh may be in Dagon's house, but there is no doubt who the winner in the war of the gods is here, is there? And he doesn't stop there. No, there's more to come from Yahweh because now God is going to turn his attention to those who rise against him and his people. Verse 6, the hand of the Lord was heavy against the people of Ashdod. And that word heavy is the same root word as the word glory in chapter 4 verse 22. God is going to show just how glorious he is through the judgment of his enemies. He afflicts them with tumours which appear to be linked chapter 6 uh, verse 4 to a plague of, of mice or rats. Lots of commentators think that this is kind of like an early form of the bubonic plague. And all they can do is keep sending the ark away, city to city. There in verses 8 to 10, Ashdod to Gath to Ekron. But wherever the ark of, uh, of God goes, well, judgment reigns. Oh, if there is any doubt that God is so big and so strong and so mighty, and by the way, I want you going home singing this song, can you tell? If there is any doubt that God is so big and so strong and so mighty, it dissolves there in verse 7, right? Look at verse 7. And when the men of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us, for his hand is hard against us and against Dagon, our God. Dagon is helpless in the face of the Lord God Almighty. Or oh, verse 12, the men who did not die were struck with tumours and the cry of the city went up where? To heaven. And not to Dagon in his temple, not to any of their other many gods, but to heaven, the dwelling place of Yahweh God Almighty. And so by the time we hit chapter 6, the decision has been made. We must send the ark back to Israel. They, verse 6, had heard what happened to Egypt back in the Exodus when Pharaoh refused to act quickly and send Israel to their freedom. And they weren't going to make the same mistake. They weren't going to stand in God's way. No way. And so in one final test to check, it really is God and not just coincidence that's afflicted them. Having prepared a guilt offering, they placed the ark, verse 7, on a new cart with two unyoked cows whose calves have been taken away from them and they send the ark on its way. If, verse 9, it heads back to Israel, back to Beth Shemesh, then it is God who is behind all that has been happening. Uh, but if more likely the unyoked cows who don't really know what they're doing when it comes to towing a cart uh, turn around and head back to their calves, which would be the entirely natural thing for them to do, right? Their calves have been taken away from them. They're going to go back to their calves. Well, if that happens, then the Philistines could be sure that it was coincidence, that these plagues were afflicting them and that God was uh, not actually uh, behind their trials. Verse 10. 
And so in verse 12, the verdict is in. And the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left. God has spoken. And he's made it abundantly clear to the people of Philistia that he is God Almighty. That Israel's God really is so big and so strong and so mighty. As unlike Dagon, with no help from human hands, he returns his ark, the symbol of his presence, not to its plinth, but to his people. And before we come on to thinking about what happens when the ark returns, I just want us to pause here and just consider a couple of implications of this for us. Uh, the first is this, 1 Samuel chapter 5 tells us that God is so big and so strong and so mighty, therefore, don't despair. Don't despair. You see, we live in a time and a place, don't we, where God's glory seems, well, seems pretty dim. I don't know about you, but I often look at our town and our nation and I feel like Phineas' wife there at the end of chapter 4, that perhaps God's glory has left the building. Then maybe our 21st century secularism with its enlightened morals and worldviews have killed God. I mean, in the UK, the church is shrinking. Uh, the Christian voice is marginalised. The gods of uh, Trafford and career and identity and self are apparently strong and vying uh, for attention. So have you ever wondered, why should we keep going? Why keep worshipping? Why keep hoping in a God who is apparently weaker than ever in our nation? Well, this tells us, friends, that appearances can be deceptive. Though when things look bleak, God is not weak. And that wasn't meant to rhyme. Not at all. He's, he's still the Lord God Almighty. He's very able to operate behind enemy lines in order to accomplish his purpose and work out his promises. Now, this passage ought to give us confidence in our God, despite appearances. You see, being in Philistia doesn't weaken or, or worry God. No, he's as glorious, he's as weighty, he's as mighty as ever, just behind enemy lines. And notice, too, he, he didn't need a pick-me-up from Israel. He didn't need to scramble a rescue team to go undercover and redeem uh, the ark. He didn't need lifting back onto his plinth by the strength of human hands. No, our God is very able to stand up for himself against those who would seek to overthrow his rule. His glory is never, ever, ever under threat. Which ought to come as a massive relief to us here in Stockport. Because I don't know about you, but as I said, I sometimes look at Stockport. Perhaps you look at your, your, your office or, or, or your school class or your friendship group and, and at how unchurched and un, how ungospeled and let's be honest, how anti-Christian it can all be. I feel overwhelmed by the task at hand. I feel, feel the weight of leading a small church here in Stockport. What if we fail? We're one of the last great bastions of faith in our town. God needs us not to fail. And yet this tells us God doesn't need us at all. We need him to show up and make himself known to this great town. This should actually, this passage should actually drive us to prayer. Prayer for your school that God would show up to your friends. Prayer for your office that God would come and save your colleagues. Prayer for your friendship groups that God would open blind eyes and soften hard hearts. That he would reveal his glory because he doesn't need us. Oh, we have the privilege of being used by him. But the glory of God, the success of fate or failure of God, his promises and plans doesn't rely on our ability to pick, a, uh, pick him up. Because guess what? God is so big and so strong and so mighty. So pray and don't despair. And of course, if we want more evidence of this, if we've got something slightly more tangible to cling to, well, it's not just this passage that tells us that God is big and strong and mighty, even when it looks otherwise, is it? Because as we go on in the Bible, we come again to a time where all seems lost and the people of God feel like God's glory has left them. 
You see, as we move on through the Bible, we find that God's dwelling with his people changes. It's no longer represented through the symbolism of an ark. In fact, the ark gets captured and lost. But now God's presence, uh, along with his people, comes through, well, through incarnation. Where God becomes flesh himself. His name's Jesus, uh, and the book of John chapter 1 tells us that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And yet fast forward to near the end of John's gospel and we come across a moment of deep despair. When God's enemies don't lift the glory of God onto a plinth, but onto a cross. Where Jesus breathes his last. And once again, God's people huddle and cower. The enemies of God seem to have won. God made flesh, killed by our human hands. And all seems lost. It seems that the glory of God has left the building. In that moment of death, God's promises once again come crashing down around the people of God. And in the face of death, there is really nothing they can do to help. There is a moment when the glory of God is dimmer than ever. But you see, as we learn here in 1 Samuel and as we remember on Easter Sunday, our God doesn't need our help. As in a moment of triumph, of jubilation, of glory up from the grave, he rose again. And with that moment, all the enemies of God know the weighty glory of the Lord God Almighty. Death loses its sting. Satan loses his grip. All of the gods are shown to be weak imitations of the death-defying, life-giving, promise-keeping God who reigns forever, even in death. I said, church, we don't despair. When things look bleak, when things look weak, when God's glory seems dim and his enemies seem strong, look to his victory. Yes, here against the Philistines, but more greatly in the resurrection. When we tried to kill Jesus once and for all and he wondrously, gloriously sprang right back. Our God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing our God cannot do, therefore don't despair. Look to the cross, look to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and rest in him. This should give us massive confidence. Our God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. But that begs a question. How are people like us to approach such a big, strong, and mighty God? And it's actually a question that the Israelites ask in chapter 20 of verse, uh, in verse 20 of chapter 6. Do you see it? Who is able to stand before the Lord? This holy God. How do we stand before God? Who can stand before God? Well, the answer to the how is stand before God with fear and trembling. Christ should stop what? Stand before God with fear and trembling. So I don't know if you notice as the passage was being read earlier, but there are two responses to God in it. Did you, did you see that? The, the first is, as we've seen, was what the Philistines do, which is they, they come uh, in front of God. They see him in all his glory and they recognise, verse 2 of chapter 6, their guilt before God. And their response to God's judgment is to, to push him away, to send him far from them. It's like those people who know that God is God, but don't really want to acknowledge it. Instead, they try to keep him at arm's length. He's too big. He's too holy. He's too mighty. I'm too weak. I'm too sinful. I'm too ashamed. So I'll keep him at arm's length. Or, or I'm, I'm fearful of his judgment and I'll send him away. I'll stick with the gods that I can somehow feel some level of control over like Dagon. Gods who need us. And so, yes, they may enslave us, but they won't ever judge us. And so we'll be safe with them. Well, that's one response to, to the might of God, set, send him away. Uh, but the second is, is revealed actually as the ark trundles back into Beth uh, Shemesh. Shemesh. Uh, Beth Shemesh is a, it's a town, uh, and it's a town where actually many of the Levite priests occupied. It's where, where they lived. You can read about the Levites earlier in your Bible, but what you need to know for the purposes of, of today is that as Levite priests, they should know all too well what the ark symbolises and how they ought to handle it. 
You see, God, in the book of Numbers, he's given very strict instructions for ark care in order to make sure, actually, that his people are protected from him and his holiness. His instructions back in Numbers are a grace to them because he doesn't want them dying as they get too close to the big, strong, almighty God of the universe. Because coming into God's presence is never something to take lightly. And yet, instead of covering the ark, as Numbers 4 told them to do, in order that they wouldn't die as they gazed upon the symbolic glory of God, well, actually, what they do is something quite different. They do the opposite and place it on, verse 15, a great stone for all to see. And instead of sacrificing a bull, as Leviticus 1 instructed, well, they sacrificed two cows that carried the ark home. It's kind of, well, it's kind of like a half-hearted attempt at worship. But their problem is that they're just kind of... Well, they're just kind of casual when it comes to God and worship, aren't they? It's a bit lip servicey, isn't it? I mean, even the Philistines with their new cart and their unyoked cows, they've shown a level of respect for the ark, whereas God's people, well, they're just a bit flippant. Sure, God in his own might and strength comes to his people. There is, verse 13, rejoicing. But there's also a lazy apathy towards him, right? They don't treat the ark with the awe that has been instructed. Instead, they're pretty casual towards the glory and majesty in verse 20, holiness of God. Israel are lazy in worship and far from wholehearted. And so look at verse 19. This is a shocking moment for the reader, actually. Uh, you, you see, uh, we, we're up for God's judgment falling upon our enemies, upon the enemies of God. But how about for uh, it falling on God's people who take God too lightly? Verse 19, God struck some of the men of Beth Shemesh because they looked upon the ark of the Lord. He struck 70 men of them and the people mourned because the Lord has struck the people with a great blow. Judgment on the Philistines who send God away and judgment on the Israelites who are over, overly familiar and too casual with God in his holiness. Who take his presence for granted. And as I finish, I think we need to heed this as a warning. How big is your God? Are you fearful of coming to God in your sin or are you apathetic about God in your Christian life? Because either way, the gospel tells us that there is another way. You see, to the Philistine, to those uh, among us whose sin is apparent, who are perhaps afraid to meet with God, who would rather keep God at arm's length and send him away, those don't, who don't want God too close, well, this morning you need to hear that there is a better way. Uh, there is a better guilt offering than gold tumours uh, and mice. Can you imagine having to fashion a gold tumour? Like, what do you base that on? That's a bit weird. God in his holiness has paved the way for people like you and me, sinners guilty, those who've lived with other gods, be it money, image, children or self, on the pedestal of our worship. Those who have lived in rebellion and enmity toward God. Those who, like the Philistines, are outside the community of God's people to be forgiven. To approach his throne in safety and grace. God has made it possible for people like us to no longer fear God's presence. Listen to how Ephesians 2 later on in our Bibles puts it. God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. The gospel tells us that rather than trying to keep God away from us, it is now possible for us to dwell with him. Yes, even us sinful men and women here today. Because of the cross of Jesus. Where he made our guilt offering. Where he paid our ransom. Where he bought us peace. And, and so if that's you here today. Afraid of God's judgment. Afraid of his wrath. One who knows that they've been an enemy of God. And fears him and his judgment. Wishes that he wanted nothing to do with you. Well the gospel says to you draw near with faith. 
By grace you can be saved. To you there is grace found in this passage. And today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. But, and I suspect that this is, is, is more pertinent for, for many of us, as you draw near to God in Christ, friends, do, do not do what the Levites of Beth Shemesh do and lose sight of who God is. Yes, he calls you to himself. Yes, he shows you mercy. Yes, he shows you grace in Christ. But he remains the holy, big, strong and mighty God of one Samuel. And so be careful that you don't approach God with casual indifference. Don't receive your salvation with flippant nonchalance. Don't take your faith or your God lightly. Oh, when I was a, a kid, uh, there was a little thing, annoying thing that we used to do at school whenever somebody got a bit tetchy. I don't know if this is a Sheffield thing or a generational thing. I suspect it probably was. Uh, if somebody was getting a bit tetchy, we'd wind them up uh, even further by responding to their tetch with the phrase, ooh, sorry, mate. And, uh, and that would just wind them up even more. And I remember once as my dad was, uh, was losing his patience with me over something, uh, some behaviour or other. I remember turning to him in his tetchiness and saying, ooh, sorry, mate. And he just glared at me. And he very clearly reminded me, Matthew, he called me Matthew when I was in trouble, Matthew, I am not your mate. I am your father. In my relationship with my dad, which was loving and it was very familiar and we were very good friends, still are. He simply took that moment to remind me of my place. I am not your mate. I am your father. So let me ask you, Christ, just stop. How big is your God and do you know your place? He's very loving. He is very gracious. He has raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. But he is God. A very big and strong and mighty God. He's not your homeboy. He's not your lucky charm that you can whisk out when you need. He's not a genie in a lamp or a big dopey great uncle who will let you get away with murder. He's not that friend you can text every once in a while and check in with or someone whose words and commands and instructions you can ignore. He's not simply the God of Sunday and to be forgotten the rest of the week and he's not to be taken lightly or flippantly. No, he's the Lord Almighty. And Hebrews 10 verse 29 warns us how much... Worst punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, who has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the, loving, of the living God. Christian, have a right reverent fear of the almighty God. The one to whom all other gods fall. The one who needs no help. The one who leads his people into safety. Oh, in his grace, he is wonderful. Run to him. <clears throat> Excuse me, but when you realise his power and his holiness, that our God is so big and so strong and so mighty as you run to him, that you must approach him, approach him, yes. He's paved the way. He delights to call us sons and daughters, but stand before him only with fear and trembling. For he is big and strong and mighty. He is the God of one Samuel who needs no one else and who will not be taken for granted. Uh, perhaps Mr. and Mrs. Beaver in the Chronicles of Narnia put it best, Narnia put it best as they chat with Lucy about Aslan. Is he quite safe? I shall feel rather nervous about meeting a lion. That you will, dearie, and no mistake, said Mrs. Beaver. If there's anyone who can appear before Aslan without their knees knocking, they're either, than, either braver than most or else just silly. Then he isn't safe, said Lucy. Safe, said Mr. Beaver. Don't you hear what Mrs. Beaver tells you? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. <laughs>
He's the king, I tell you. How big is your God? Let's pray together. Paul in Romans 12 says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Lord God Almighty, we thank you that you are God of gods, Lord of lords. Creator, sustainer, redeemer. Father God, we thank you that we can have confidence that all your promises will come to pass because of who you are. We thank you for this reminder in 1 Samuel that you are the mighty God. But we thank you, Heavenly Father, that as mighty God, we can still call you Father, that you have made it possible for us to draw near to you. That we can escape your judgment. That we can delight in relationship with you. Help us to rest in that great truth. But Lord, don't allow us to grow cold to your might and sovereignty and wonder and awe. Instead, help us to remember daily just who you are. That as we do, we would be able to present our bodies to you as a living sacrifice. That our worship wouldn't be half-hearted. But instead, we would live our lives in the light of who you are and what you have done. And press that deeply on our hearts, we pray. Transform us this morning, we pray. Amen.